Mm. So I went to Catholic school mm -hmm. the first uh, eight years. Mm. And then I went to public school. And you have gym classes. And you go out, you sweat, you come in, you take a shower, and there's nudity. And, and a lack of you know, modesty, so to speak. And it's, it's was that in the Catholic school? No, no public. It was in the public. It was in the public school. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, even at the Catholic, St. Mary's Academy, they did not have private um, shower stalls. So it might be a cultural thing. It might be a matter of convenience. But we are exposed. To, to nudity at a rather early age mm. in, in this country. And I understand in Europe, they're even. Oh, it's, uh, it's worse. Yeah. 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 So, so I think it can lead into, not necessarily, but it can lead into, you know, mm -hmm. other things, okay? So we just have to be a little bit careful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay, so scripture witnesses to the disastrous influence of the one Jesus calls a murderer from the beginning who would even try to subvert him. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. But that's why Jesus Christ came into the world, to destroy the works of the devil. Because the devil is our enemy. So in its, in its consequences, the greatest of these works was the mendacious seduction that led man to disobey God. What does that word mean, Father? Malicious. Malicious. What does that mean? Malicious. Bad. 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 <laughs> yes. Seduction. Hmm? Mendacious. And of course, uh, as you see, with every, every sin, it is seduction. Something is seducing you. Okay? It, may not be, it may not be a person, maybe a person, but even a thing is just, wow, it looks good, it looks good. Okay? <laughs> so it looks good. So what? If it looks good, why do you want to steal it? <laughs> to cover. Whatever looks good, you want to cover it. Yeah? Okay? Just appreciate its beauty. There was a, um, a priest, you know, who, an old priest who taught us when we first entered the seminary. He used to tell us, again, okay, that if you see a beautiful woman, appreciate for them for who they are. And then he would compare it with uh, this example. That if you are walking by and you see beautiful flowers in your neighbor's yard, what do you do? You go and sneak and pluck them and run away? No, we don't normally do that. You just look at a flower and appreciate, wow, it's beautiful. And you leave it alone. So that's what you do with people. You can't say that uh, someone who is beautiful and you say, oh, they are ugly. No, okay? <laughs> they are beautiful, okay? But they don't belong to you. It's somebody else's flower. Don't steal it. <laughs> okay? So we can appreciate beauty without becoming, you know, crazy. Appreciate she used to say, one of the tapes I had of him, he comments, he was eating with some friends, and a beautiful woman walked, walked by, and he commented, that's a very beautiful woman. And they all looked at him, he said, hey, the Lord said I could look at the menu, but I can't order it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we have to appreciate beauty, okay? It's God's beauty, he made it beautiful. We can't say it's ugly, but it's beautiful, okay? Yes, but appreciation of beauty doesn't mean destruction of beauty. Okay, or abusing it, or misusing it. Okay, so the power of Satan is, and this is a very important thing to remember, okay, because sometimes when you hear some, usually in the Catholic Church, not, not so bad, but in some Pentecostal churches, it's like this, somebody can see the devil in every bush. Okay, and that's one of the failures. <clears throat> you know, you hear about the charismatic movement. It's a very good movement. And it's an approved devotion in the church, the Catholic church, the charismatic movement. Mm -hmm. But in some circles, it had gone wild, copying Pentecostal kind of practices. Okay? And so in some charismatic circles, what you would hear is the devil, the devil, the devil, as if there is no God. 
Okay? Yeah, the devil can do this. The devil can do this. Okay? We give the devil too much credit or credence or power, which power he actually doesn't have. He has power, but he is not God. Okay? So listen to this uh, statement here, paragraph. The power of Satan is nonetheless not infinite. The devil is not God. Okay? He is only a creature, powerful from the fact that he is pure spirit, but still a creature. Okay? So we have to be aware of that. He cannot prevent the building up of God's reign. In other words, the devil cannot defeat God. <clears throat> So however much evil we see around us, we must always know, believe, hope, and surely hope that good will in the end triumph. Because good is more powerful than evil. Yes, evil will do damage, but it cannot overcome the kingdom of God. Okay? Although Satan may act in the world out of hatred for God and his kingdom in Christ Jesus, and although his action may cause grave injuries of a spiritual nature and indirectly even of a physical nature to each man and to society, the action is permitted by divine providence which with strength and gentleness guides human and cosmic history. Now look at that statement again. The action of the devil is permitted by divine providence. What kind of providence that is? What is divine providence? We said the dispositions by which God is guiding his creation to perfection. How is he using evil, how, or rather permitting evil okay, to bring about that perfection? Jesus you see how it would be logically, humanly speaking, contradictory. But we can see what we call the contradiction of the cross. Right. Yes. So whenever we look at evil okay, and we are overwhelmed, the only way we look at is the way of the cross. Okay. As Pope Francis says, you know, there may not be an explanation Logically, but there is a way. And the way is the way of the cross. That is divine providence, which brought about our salvation. How can God provide through such a terrible act? That's how he chose to do it. If you want to argue with him, die and go and argue. <laughs> okay? But that's what he did. Okay? And so whenever we are suffering, we must remember and unite our sufferings to the sufferings of Christ and know that we are walking the way of divine providence. Remember, I think it was Padre Pio who said that there is a lot of suffering in this world. As you know, everybody suffers, even those who seem euphoric. Every human soul suffers because there is sin in the world. There is sin in my heart, in my soul. So everybody suffers. Mm -hmm. But it's said that most of our suffering is simply wasted. Because it's not united to the cross of Christ. And therefore it doesn't become redemptive. It doesn't become salvific. So if we are to suffer anyway, why not make our suffering beneficial? By uniting it to the sufferings of Christ so that it becomes redemption for me and for others as well. Take up your cross every day and follow me. Okay? So that's what that statement means. The action is permitted, meaning evil, by divine providence, which with strength and gentleness guides human and cosmic history. It is a great mystery that providence should permit diabolical activity. It's a mystery. So never sit there and try to understand it, to come up with a logical <coughs> explanation, because it will not be there. It's beyond our understanding. Okay? It is a great mystery. Not just a mystery, but a great mystery 
that providence should permit diabolical activity. But we know that in everything, God works for good with those who love him. As scripture tells us. Okay? So that is the fall of the angels. Okay? So never be told that there is no devil. Because if there is no devil, by the way, do you not know, do you notice the logic? If there is no devil, then there is no evil. Okay? If there is no devil, there is no evil. Okay? If there is no evil, there is no sin. Okay? If there is no sin, there is no need for redemption. If there is no need for redemption, there is no need for a redeemer. If there is no need for a redeemer, there is no redeemer, and therefore there is no God. See the logic of denying that there is a devil? Automatically you deny that there is no God. So it is sad for any Christian to say that, oh, I don't think there is a devil. Well then, there is no God. Okay. But we know that there is evil. We see it right before our eyes. Okay. And we know that it is evil because there is good. Okay? So evil attests to the fact that there is a God, a good God. Okay? So that's the fallen angels. Okay? Original sin, freedom put to the test. God created man in his image and established him in his friendship. Remember what we said, that God is never in the image of man. God is not made in the image of man. Man is made in the image, image of God. God. Okay? So God created a man in his image and established him in his friendship. What does establishing in friendship mean? Covenant relationship. God meant us to be with him. So to be fully human is to be in a living and loving union or communion with God. Okay? If we are not in friendship with God, we are not fully human. Remember the saying of St. Irenaeus? The glory of God is man alive, and the life of man is the vision of God. So if we don't see God, we are not fully alive. Okay? So a spiritual creature, man can live in this friendship, a spiritual creature, man can live this friendship only in free submission to God. Not coercion. That's the uh, the evil of groups like ISIL or ISIS. Okay. You can't force people to believe. God doesn't do it. Okay. A God who coerces people to believe is not God. God is not Allah. It is the devil. God doesn't force us. He made us free. And we must submit to him freely. Okay? So the prohibition against the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil spells this out. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. I had a priest on uh, Immaculate Heart Radio say, oh, but they didn't die. They died spiritually. Friendship died. They didn't die. Wow. They didn't. <laughs> so, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolically, symbols, I guess, symbolically, evokes the insurmountable limits that man, being a creature, must freely recognize and respect with trust. Here you say higher power, you can do whatever. Oh, the horizon is unlimited. That's, th th those are just the stupid idioms. Okay? A human by being is limited. 
Like right now, however much I want to be in Beijing, I can't be there now. Why? Because of the limiting principle called the body. You've heard of people say, or oh, some say it's bilocated. There is no evidence that anybody has ever done that. There is no evidence, you know, they are going to be whatever, but there is no evidence that anybody has ever done that. And remember that there is no anywhere in scripture during his earthly life that they said Jesus was in three or four or five places at the same time. If anybody could bilocate, it would be him. It would be him. Okay, so we hear people say that, but uh, I don't believe it is true. And of course, there are so many other sayings, you know, people say. Because, for example, the attribute to St. Francis of Assisi that he said, okay, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. There's no evidence that St. Francis ever said that. But everybody says, oh, St. Francis, because it's a very dangerous saying. Preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. Which means, words are not really necessary. It's only acts. But that's not what Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us both proclamation and deed. But those sayings become popular simply because we are not really courageous witnesses. St. Francis didn't do it. He went around to preaching and doing works of charity. So when did he say that? <laughs> okay. At least there's no evidence that he ever said it. He may have said it, but there's no evidence. So, the symbolic thing that insurmountable limits that man being a creature must freely recognize. We have limitations. I can't see what is going to happen this evening. I can speculate, but I cannot know for sure. I can say, well, I'm going to Boulder City at six to do this and whatever. Yes, I'm saying that, but I may not be able to even be there. Right. I can't tell for sure. Okay. So we are, we are limited. Okay? And we must respect those recognitions, rather limitations, with trust in God. God didn't make us put those limitations to us simply because he's preventing us from seeing something. That's the degree of perfection he accorded us as human beings. That's what God wanted us to be. And it will be fully happy, we won't lack anything. Okay? So the devil wants to, uh, to tell us that no, you can acquire more and become something that is more than merely human. What is that? Okay, some people have said that's one of the reasons when God chose, chose to came to become part of his creation, not part of him, but when he chose to assume our nature, okay, he didn't become an angel. He became a human being, flesh and blood, soul and divinity. Now one cannot say, well, Jesus uh, embraced the limitations and whatever. That is the degree of perfection God accorded us, and it would be fully happy as human beings. I can't be happy as an angel because I'm not an angel. And I wouldn't want to be one because that's not God's will for me. Okay. Being an angel is not going to add anything to my happiness. Angels are happy in their own way. Humans are happy in their own way. Okay. We'll enjoy fullness of perfection which God accorded to us. So those limitations must be accepted. Okay. It's the same way with life. Okay? We are born as children. People take care of us. We grow as adults. You know, We try to take care of ourselves and other people. And then we grow old and we need other people to take care of us. But, okay, so if it's available, people are trying to offer help. Don't say, oh, no, 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 I'm fine. We have to accept those limitations. 
in life. They are part of God's providence okay, to perfect us. Some of you know Father Spitzer. Spitzer, okay, on uh, EWTN. He is a highly philosophical, okay, very theological. Okay, but you know, he said, he, these are his words, I'm paraphrasing, that well, I was, you know, you know, I was proud, okay, he's intelligent, okay, very intelligent and knowledgeable, if you have ever seen him, okay, you know, he's very intelligent and knowledgeable. But he said that probably because he can't see well now, okay, he has lost his sight almost completely, but he said probably you know, this is one of the things that helped me to become humble. To realize that I can't do it on my own. I will need other people around me to help me. Okay. Because I have limitations. But when we feel strong, we think that there are no limitations. We are not limited. That's what makes us think we are God. Okay. So that's why the church is keen here again. Insurmountable limits that man, being a creature, must be freely recognize, to see them, recognize them, and respect with trust. We recognize them and respect them with trust, not to resent them. They are part of divine providence, those limitations. So man is dependent on his creator, okay, and is subjected to the laws of creation and to the moral norms that govern the use of freedom. The norms, the moral norms, natural law and revealed law, okay? They govern the use of freedom. If we jump out of the perimeters of the moral law, human freedom becomes poisonous. That's why today you hear people say, oh, I'm free to do whatever I want. Because one jumps out of the perimeters of the moral law and everything is poisonous. I do whatever I want at my own detriment. Because that's not the way God intended human freedom to be used. Will he allow me to abuse that freedom? Yes. God doesn't kill me, so why do you why, why bother me? Leave me alone. But we self-destruct. Okay, let's take a break.